Today, the scripture text is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, from verses 1 to 14. Okay, let me read better. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have sent him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, that the Father is in me? The words I said to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than this because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Thanks, Pastor, for the privilege to share with you God's word for today. Uh, she's asked me actually to take a series uh, three in a row, so not, not in a row, uh, one each month. So I'll be taking the fourth Saturday of June, July, and August. And so I was thinking, what, how, how, what do I do? How, what do I share? And I felt the prompting to just uh, go back to the verse that Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Um, it's a verse that we all know very familiar, but what actually does it mean when Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life? So my intention would be through the three uh, weekends would be focus on one of them each week. All right? And so for this weekend, the emphasis would be, I am the way. What does it mean when Jesus says, I am the way? Let's just commit this time to God. Father, we just want to praise you. We want to thank you because you are the almighty God. You are in absolute control of everything. You are sovereign. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for your love for each one of us. We thank you that you are interested in each one of us, that you have called each one of us by name. You knew us even before we were formed in our mother's womb. And yet, even as we come, O oh God, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and make your word simple for us to understand. That not just for head knowledge, but be able to understand it and to be able to apply it in our lives. And so, Father, we pray that your word will come alive in us today. We pray, Lord, your word will be real. And so, Lord, we commit each of us to you. Ask, Holy Spirit, that you give us a teachable heart. Open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you read through the uh, scripture reading, you find that the apostles were pretty confused. A lot of questions they were asking. 
All right? Let's look at the context of this passage. All right? What was the context of this passage? This was where? Where was he speaking? He was speaking after the Last Supper. All right? He has washed the disciples' feet. Uh, and, 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 and then it's like his farewell speech uh, because he knew he was going to die. Okay? We, we can say it could be his last will and testament, but yet because we knew he resurrected and he came back and he spent another seven weeks with the disciples, so he had a lot more to say after that. But in, in the normal context of things, this was his like, my last words. All right. Now, bear in mind as well that what was happening in the upper room was the culmination of a week of things that were happening. All right. Uh, Jesus has been looking to this time where he knew he had to go to the cross. But to the disciples, it was anything but clear. All right? Uh, if you remember, he was on the way uh, towards Jerusalem when he heard Lazarus had died. All right? And it took another four days before he reached Bethany. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. All right? And then later on, six days before the Passover, he stayed with Mary and Martha. And at that evening, what happened? Mary brought out this most expensive uh, perfume, which Judas says, why are you spending that much money on that perfume? It costs the year's wages. And Jesus rebuked Judas and says, don't stop her. Allow her to do all that because she is anointing him before his death. And then you find that the next day, or the day after, he, he, uh, next day he comes into Jerusalem where he is what? Uh, they, they were calling him the king, the saviour that was going to come and save them from the Romans. All right? And so, if you're going to be one of the disciples, and I want you to try and imagine that you are one of the disciples with him in the upper room. You are seeing all these kind of things happening. What would be going through your mind? You see, we, we are 2,000 years later, we have the benefit of what we call hindsight. We can look back at events, all right, and we know what is happening or what happened. But if you were one of the disciples there, how would you be reacting? What would be going through your mind? Probably a lot of confusion. Lots and lots of confusion. I mean, what's going on? He's talking about going away. He's talking about dying. And then he's talking about he's the saviour of the world. It doesn't compute in today's language. All right? Is he the Messiah who is to come? To save them, and why is he talking about death? All right? It doesn't make sense. And he's going away, where is he going to? You, you can see in that context, the disciples were really, really confused. So, what would you be doing if you were in that upper room? All right? You've been with him for three plus years. All right? Imagine you're one of these disciples. You've been with him for more than three years. You've seen him perform miracles. And what are those miracles? You have seen him turn water into wine. All right? You've seen people healed in many ways. He touches them, or, or even when he touches them, people touch him and they are healed. And he's even able to heal remotely. Remember the centurion who came to him and said, my servant is, healed, uh, is ill. Can you heal him? And Jesus wanted to go. And he said, no, you don't have to go. You just need to say the word and I know my servant will be healed. And Jesus was so impressed with his faith. 
right? You have seen him deliver people from demons, legions of demons, tons of demons in them, and yet he has delivered them. You've seen people raised from the dead, Lazarus, still fresh in their minds. Feeding of the thousands. You've seen him with five loaves and two fishes, feeding, all right, the Bible says 5,000, but actually it's more than 5,000. The 5,000 refers to the men. You're not including the women and the children, and that could easily come to eight to 10,000, all with five loaves and two fishes. You've seen that happen right before your very eyes. You've seen him control over nature. You were with him in the boat, he was sleeping in one corner and the boat was rocking. It was about to capsize and he was like sleeping like a baby. I wish I could do that. I can't. And he delivers fish into your nets. Remember the disciples when they were fishing the whole night and they caught nothing. And what did Jesus say? Cast your net on the right side of the boat. They did that, and what happened? So much fish came into the nets that they couldn't even pull it all out. All right? So you, you, you've seen him confound spiritual leaders with, his, with answers that we would, how do you say, uh, a, like a, a smart elect would answer. You and I wouldn't be able to think of, of these kind of answers to, to people who wanted to put him in a situation where he would be caught. Remember the, the, the lady who was, the woman that was brought to him uh, who was caught in adultery and says, the law calls us to stone this woman who has been caught in adultery. Wanting to catch him and see what his response would be. And what was Jesus' reaction? He just stooped down, all right, uh, squat down, and, and, and to himself, draw something on the, on, on the sand, and he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Would we have thought of an answer like that? No. But they have seen him doing these kind of things. Alright? And God is a man. I mean, it is unheard of. If you look at the Old Testament, all right, you look at the encounter in the so-called Torah, the first five books, you can't even come near God. And, 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 and the, there are only a few people that have actually come into the presence of God. And even that, they could not see God. What did God tell Moses? God, Moses wanted to be able to see God and God says, you can't see me. I can give you a glimpse, but you can't see me because if you see me, you will die. And now, he said, I'm here, God is coming, I'm here as man. If you see me, you have seen the Father. I mean, this concept was totally out of from, way, from left field, totally out of, how do you say, people's imagination or people's acceptance. It's just like somebody coming in today in our time and says, I am Jesus. I've come back. What would your reaction be? I know I would be very confused. I would not be able to have come to a decision. I would be very, very confused. So many questions, but not enough answers. We're privileged today because we are 2,000 years after that. We're able to look back at the events, at what has happened, and the arguments that have put forth. And in many a time, we can rationally, we can rationalize, we can reason it out and say, yes, Jesus is God. But if we were in that situation 2,000 years ago, 
how would we be reacting? All right, let's, when Jesus says, I am the way, what does it mean? All right? The word the, all right, or in Greek, it's, uh, it sounds like he, but it's with an apostrophe there, all right? It's a definite article with emphasis as there is no alternative. It is as opposed to a way. So in other words, in the English context, it is a way versus the way. All right? When we talk a way, what does it mean? It means it's one of many other possible alternatives. It's a way. But Jesus claims to be the way. In other words, it's it's good as saying he is the only way. There's no other alternative. We hear people in the world today say there are many ways to God. You have Hinduism, you have uh, Buddhism, you have Islam, you have Christianity, you have Baha'i and all that. There are all different ways to go to God. All right? If God is on a mountain, there are many different ways to get up to the mountain. But Jesus is coming to us and says, Nope, He is the way. He is the only way. All right? So the way in Greek means way, road, journey, or path. And so Jesus claims to be the only hodos to the Father, the only way to God. So what are the implications, all right? Very obvious, there's no other way. In other words, Jesus is telling you that you have three choices. Either what he says is correct, or he is a liar, he knows he's not the way, but he claims to be the way. Or the other third alternative is his cuckoo. He is deluded. He is not the way, but he thinks he is the way. If you go to a mental institution, you have a lot of people who claim to be Jesus, who claim to be God, who claim to be this, who claim to be that. They are mentally unstable. So when Jesus claims to be the way, the implication is he's saying there is no other way. He's saying either you accept me for what I am or you call me a liar or I am a gila person. I'm a crazy person. All right? So the implication of that is you don't have the choice to say he's a good person. He is a good teacher. He's a miracle worker. He's not claiming that. He's claiming that he is the only way to God and that he is God himself. And so you have to consider him on that basis. Alright? Being the way also means that he is the guide. He will show you how to do it. How to be able to go back to God. Alright? And he says he is the path to follow. You follow what he does or what he instructs, all right? And he gives you directions. He's like a GPS, all right? He's like a spiritual GPS. When we are confused, distracted, uh, uncertain, or lost in life, he shows the way. The Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. If you are not sure about anything, ask God. God is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. Ask God. And the Bible says that He will give His wisdom, He will pour out His wisdom in abundance to those who ask. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs. Not fear in the sense of being scared, but fear in terms of reverence, respecting Him revering Him. That's when you begin to see things from God's perspective. What is wisdom? 
Wisdom is essentially seeing things from God's perspective. Or you've heard me say, common sense is not that common. Common sense is actually, if you think about a lot of the things that are common sense, is actually seeing things from God's perspective. And common sense is not common. A lot of people don't have common sense because they do not have the wisdom of God. Okay, let's see what was God's original plan. When God first created the world, the heavens and the earth, what was his original design? What was he having in mind? All right? God created man in his own image. Remember Genesis? He said, let us make man in our image. All right? And <clears throat> he intended to have this relationship with his creation. And, and mankind is the only one, all right, where he says, after he's creating them, he says it was very good. All right? He breathed his life into man after he created him. In other words, mankind has got something special that is not found in other forms of creation. And God intended to have a meaningful relationship with mankind. All right? So what did he do? All right? He met their basic needs for significance, for security and acceptance. All right? Let's look at the verses that I'm referring to. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you the plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Adam and Eve were the first vegetarians. You realize that? God's original intention was not meat, but eventually later after uh, he allowed us to eat meat. But originally in God's original design, we were all were going to be vegetarians. Right? Sorry, Kim Tae, no pork. <laughs> okay. It goes on to say, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Then the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, basically, God met the needs of the two people he created and eventually all of creation as well. He gave them significance. He gave them a job. He says, rule over all the things that I've created. Have dominion over them. He gave them a purpose. All right? And he gave them security. They didn't have to worry about food because God provided the food for them already. And their basic needs to be loved and accepted. God loved them and accepted them as they were. They had a relationship with each other. And God's intention was never to be just the three of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's design has always been to include his creation in all that, uh, how do you say, he, he, his intention was always to have a group of people in relation with him. And his intention was always for eternity. It is not for the here, for the now, but for eternity. You see, when he created Adam and Eve, 
time as we know now did not exist. God's intention for Adam and Eve was eternity. They were going to be with Him forever. Until they sinned, and what happened? Time as we knew came into play. But God's intention, all right, God knew, okay? Now, even before God created Adam and Eve, even before all of creation, He already knew man was going to sin. You see, God is not bound by time. We are bound by time. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now or even the next 30 seconds. But God already knows how the end of this world is going to be. From the very beginning, that's why we say there is no beginning and there's no end with God. He's the first and the last. He is not bound by time. We are bound by time. He sees the beginning and the end all at one go. He knows exactly what is happening. So he already knew even before he created man that man was going to fall into sin. So he already had in mind the plan of salvation. And God intended all right, uh, to restore back His original design and that includes at the end of time this group of people who believe in Him to join Him in the wedding feast. In the book of Revelation, it says, Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. You see, God has never intended to be just the three of them. God has intended for His creation to enjoy eternity with Him. But because Adam sinned, that plan was disrupted. And so Jesus came, all right? Jesus came, all right, to do that. And what we see in the Old Testament and in the Mosaic Law, all right, we, we, we tend to take the Ten Commandments as that is the way to live a life that is pleasing to God. Actually, if you read through Romans, Paul tells you the law actually is to show us that it is impossible to meet the requirements or to live the life that God origi- uh, that, uh, that, that God's standards is just impossible to live up to. His demands are so high that it is impossible for you and I to live up to those standards. All right? And Isaiah says, All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins are sweep us away. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 uh, Matthew says that our attitudes and inner thoughts are the same as our, the intended actions. In other words, Jesus comes and says, you know, you talk about the law. He says, your thought life, how you think, is as good as the action itself. And he says, hatred is like murder. If you hate somebody, it's as good as killing that person. I mean, instead of just the Ten Commandments, he raised the standards even higher. How many of us can say, I've never hated anybody? You may not have physically killed somebody, but we will have hated some some people who have done something to us. And by God's standard, it is as good as murder. If you look at another person lustfully, Jesus says that is, you're already committing adultery. I mean, this is the standard that Jesus is saying is to meet God's standard. And you and I will never be able to come up to meet God's standard. 
All right? And so God provided a solution in the person of Jesus. You see, we need to understand God's character. Yes, we know God is loving, He is compassionate, He is graceful, He is merciful. But yet, at the same time, we also know that God is just, He is holy, He is righteous. And if there is sin, there must be a penalty that is to be paid for sin. If you look at how he, uh, how, do you, how, how he brings about in the Old Testament, what is the price to pay for sin? He instituted in the Moses, Mosaic law or the, uh, the, what we call a sin offering. And what is the sin offering? They had to take a young lamb which is without blemish. In other words, they had to find a lamb that is white, that is pure, and without any deformity. And they had to offer that lamb, slaughter that lamb, and the blood of that lamb would then pay the price of that person's sin for that year. All right? That is to meet up to God's demands of payment for sin. So, God knew man was going to sin. So, His plan was to have Jesus come. Now, in order for Jesus to meet God's righteous standards, He had not only to live a perfect life, but He also was, had to be willing to die and offer His blood as payment for our sin. Alright, so it's not just about living the perfect life, a life that is pure and, and, and meet all of God's requirements that even in his thinking that he did not have any lustful thoughts or he did not have any hatred. He had to meet to those standards and yet also prepare to die for you and I so that his blood can pay the price for our sin. Because by our own way, we could never meet up to God's standards. All right? So, through Jesus, God restored to us what Adam and Eve lost. Adam and Eve lost what? Eternal life. God has now given back to us eternity if we accept Jesus. We now are accepted by God. God loves us. His love for us is perfect. And His love for us is by grace. It's not about what you do. He loves you because of who He is, not because of who we are. He loves us despite the fact that we still fall into sin. But He loves us. He's the God of second chance. He's, he's, he's willing to endure. He's a long-suffering God. You know, we are not very long-suffering people. When people do something about, uh, against us, yeah, first time, okay, you let it go. Second time, you let it go. After the third, fourth, fifth time, you're you very mang chung already. But God is a God of long-suffering. He's a God who is willing to allow us to fail again and again and again. All right? uh, he's, he gives us security. We know He will never leave us or abandon us. He has said that. I will never leave you or abandon you. I will be with you. And He gives us significance. You are very important in God's sight. You are very special because there's only one of you in all of creation. There's no one else. Right? You, all of us are special in God's sight. Very, very special. Why? Because Jesus died for you. All right? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
All right. Now, let's look a little bit more about God's ways. Last week, we heard from Pastor Paul Christie. He says, unless the Lord builds, what happens? We labor in vain. What it means is, if you don't have God guiding you, showing you, all your efforts are in vain, wasted. Wasted. Unless the Lord builds, we labor in vain. All of us can have fantastic plans, even if we're in church, as a church leader, if I have all these plans that I want to do for the church. What does it indicate? It's not God's plans, it's my plan. You have all these dreams of your family, what you want for your children, for, for anything. If God is not telling you what it is, it's all in vain. Your career. God is saying if he is, if you don't involve him, if you don't follow his ways, everything you do is wasted. All right? God's ways is also narrow and hard. I, I, I don't, I, we don't want to sugarcoat this. All right? Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. In other words, God is saying His way is not an easy way. There are going to be struggles, there are going to be obstacles, but it will bring you life. You see, the way we've been brought up in this world is that I want to be free from pain, I want to be free from everything, I don't want to have any problems, I want to have lots of money, I just want to have fun, I want to have easy life. God is saying that's not His way. God is saying there will be challenges in life. Life is going to be difficult. If anyone comes and tells you, accept Jesus and all your problems are gone, it's not true. In fact, I think Christians have got more problems than non-Christians. And you may ask, why does God allow this? Firstly, it's because these difficult situations God allows in our lives is to refine our character. Is to make us more and more like the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, if they persecute me, all right, Jesus was saying, if they persecute him, who are we as his followers to escape persecution? If we think that we will escape persecution, we are deluding ourselves. Now, persecution can come in many forms. Difficult challenges in life, being rejected by other people and things like that. Persecution does not necessarily mean you're going to, uh, you know, be thrown into jail. It could include that, but it, persecution can come in many forms. And the challenge for us is not to pray away these difficult things in life. All right. You know that our natural human tendency is that when some difficult, when we experience difficult, God, please remove this away from me. That's not biblical. You know? Even Jesus, you know, in his prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he pray? One of his last prayers to Jesus, Father, if this you know, his desire was that this situation where he was going to be put, uh, what you call uh, caught, being flogged, and uh, on the, die on the cross, he says, if this can be taken away, it will be great, but if it not, your will be done. Right? What we need to understand is this. God is absolutely sovereign. 
Nothing can happen to you without God's permission. That's how special you are. Nothing can happen to you without God's permission. And His ways are perfect. He does not make any mistakes. So anything that happens to us, God has allowed it. That is why in Thessalonians, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God concerning you. COVID, God allowed it to happen. Let me say, I personally feel very uneasy when we pray God take away this COVID. Our prayer should be God help us to persevere through this, to be patient, to continue to hold our hope and trust in you as we wait upon your ways. You've heard some people have shared, you know, in China, the Western world will pray that the persecution of the church in China will go away. But the Christians in China says, do not pray that prayer. Pray that we will be faithful to God in this persecution. Pray that we will not run away from our faith under persecution. Because they also know that under persecution, the church grows. When times are easy, actually, numbers go down. So, a lot of these things that we have in life, the difficult things in life, God is using them to mold our character to be more and more like the person of Jesus. It's just like pain, all right? Those of you who have been through the Freedom in Christ course, we, we say, would you want to pray that God will take away pain if you have that opportunity? What would happen if you, there was no pain? You won't know that there's something wrong with you physically. Pain in your body is to indicate to you that something is wrong with your body. You realize that? So if you were to take away pain, you won't know. All right? Those who have leprosy, the parts of the body that, that are deformed, the nerves have been, the nerves are dead. They can knock into sharp things and bleed to death because they do not feel any pain. So some of the difficult things that we have in life, God is trying to tell us something is wrong and we need to make right. He allows difficult things in life so that we learn to trust Him, we learn to believe that He is still in control, that He is able to turn around things for our good. Alright? It means turning away from the ways of this world. It means turning away from the values of this world. The world teaches us that the things that happen to us in the here and now is very important. But the Bible teaches us that we are made for eternity. Our time on earth is very short in comparison to eternity. Even if you live a hundred years, the hundred years may seem very long, but in the scheme of things, the hundred years is very small. You and I have been made for eternity. And so that's why Jesus says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven because that is for eternity. All right? And God gives us a choice. All right, throughout the Bible, you will see God asking His people to choose life or death. All right? In Deuteronomy, it says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life 
that you and your offspring may live loving the Lord, obeying His voice and holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, to give them. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. God does not want us to be robots, but He gives us that choice. Do you want to choose life or do you want to choose death? God's promises are for our good. He says, if you trust Him, if you follow His ways, life is going to be good. It may be difficult, but life is going to be good. It's your choice. It's for all of creation. The way He dealt with Israel, He deals the same with us. We have a choice. Do you want to choose life or do you want to choose death? All right? God's ways has also got many benefits. All right? Let me just tell you that it's not just about a difficult life. If you choose to believe God and you want to follow His ways, there are lots of benefits. We're not alone. He's with us all the way. Through the most difficult times in life, God is with you. He will never leave you or abandon you. That is your guarantee. His way is the best and is perfect. God being our creator knows what we are best used for. And whatever He has planned for us is the best. Because God does not make a mistake. There's no plan B in God. In God's, uh, there's no plan B for our lives as far as God is concerned. He only has one plan and that plan is the best. You know, sometimes when we plan, if plan A fails, we have plan B. If plan B fails, we have plan C. God only has one plan, and that's the best plan. All right? He knows what we are best for, and He does not make any mistakes. All right? And God gives life to the fullest. He says, I have come that you might have life, and life to the fullest. God wants you to enjoy life. God wants you to have fun. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to really enjoy life. Sometimes we think God is a killjoy. God wants to make life miserable for us. No. God wants us to have fun. Can we say that? God wants us to have fun? You know, they, they, sometimes we walk around in life as though we were baptized in vinegar. Our sour face is so long no, God wants us to have fun. Because our God is a fun God. Alright? And the other thing is, God has already created good works for us way in advance, even before we were born. Like I said, nothing happens to us by chance. So every incident that happens in your life, God has allowed it, God has arranged it. And all, all this means is that God has already created opportunities for us to be involved in His work. You see, as a Christian, sometimes we think, I've got to go out there to do things for God. Jesus says in John, he says, I can do nothing on my own. Jesus himself says, I can do nothing on my own. Can you imagine? Jesus himself says he can do nothing on his own. What does he do? He says, I see what my father is doing and I join him at what he's doing. In other words, God is already saying that in your daily life, he is already involved. He has already gone ahead of us. He has prepared things for us to do. We just need 
the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see what He is doing in and around our lives so that every opportunity He creates, we are there. We are joining Him in doing what He is doing. And that's what the life is all about. You see, God has actually intended for us to have a very simple life. We make our life very complicated. Right? And Psalm 23 is a good analogy of God as the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one. He leads me in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. See, God has just wants you to just trust Him and believe Him. No matter how difficult life is, He is going to be there guiding us through. All right? And His way is full of grace and truth. Our God is not a God of legalism. It's not about, you must do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, then I love you. No. He loves us despite the fact that we fail Him. He loves us despite the fact we do not live up to His expectation. He loves us because of who He is, not because of what we do. That's what grace is all about. In fact, the entire Christian life is grace. You and I, who we are today, is an act of God's grace. We deserve death and punishment. But God has given us life. The fact that we are alive each morning is an act of God's grace. Everything is an act of God's grace. Every blessing that you have is an act of God's grace. And it's a journey of discovery. God's way is a journey of discovery, of discovering how to become more and more like the person of Jesus. So I just want to close and ask us to just reflect. Have you ever made that personal decision to follow God's way, to follow Jesus? It's not about coming to church. It's not about coming to Sunday school. It's not about following a set of rituals. It's, it, it's a personal decision that you have to make. Your parents can't make that decision for you. You have to make that decision yourself. To follow His way. Coming to church every week is not going to save you. Following Jesus, accepting what He has done for you is what saves you. And it's not about saving, being saved, but it's about following Him so that you experience the fullness of the life that He has meant for you to have. He wants you to have a full, meaningful, exciting, fun life. But that can only happen if you choose to follow His way. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus, as the way. We confess that without Him, we are so often lost, confused. We have experienced in our daily lives when we try and do things on our own and we leave you out of we leave you out of it we're so often in a mess
Help us, Lord, to see that you are the way, that you are there waiting for us to allow you to guide us, to show us that your way is the best. Father, help us to teach us to surrender our plans, our hopes, our dreams for ourselves, for our children, for our families, for our loved ones. God, help us to surrender that all to you and just trust you that you will show us that your way is the best way. Father, open our eyes to what is the truth. So Lord, we thank you for being with us this day. Holy Spirit, we ask that you continue to search our hearts to enable us to surrender to you our lives, our hopes, our dreams because of who you are. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.